let's talk about uh, Mencius and his work, the Book of Mencius. Mencius was born in the tiny principality of Zhou, a dependency of Lu. He is close to the heartland of Confucianism. He later served at the court of King Xuan of Qi. King Xuan was said to be the founder of the Jixia Academy. The king was evidently prepared to listen to any of the intellectuals of his time. As the patron of intellectuals, King Xuan is prepared to provide Mencius with rank and salary. Mencius participates in the highbrow culture of his day. He tried to give advice on how to rule, but the king is not prepared to take his message seriously. In fact, quote, he never secured a sympathetic hearing, no matter where he went, end quote. The Book of Mencius is a compilation of his disciples. Unlike the Analects, the Mencius provides us not only with the isolated aphorisms and sayings of the master, but with a wealth of well-argued discourse as well. The Mencius contains much elucidation of Confucian ideas. These ideas are only touched on in the Analects. Mencius does not want to make manifest a new vision of Confucianism. He just wants to defend his faith in Confucianism. He is prepared to use every tool available to him to defend his position. We will find applications of some of the dialectic and logical categories used by the moist logicians and other intellectuals in the school of names. Mencius uses these tools because he has no other alternatives, not because he believes that they provide the true method for arriving at truth. His disciple Gong Du Zi says, quote, Outsiders all say that you are fond of argument. I venture to ask why, end quote. Mencius replies, quote, I am not fond of argument. I simply have no alternative. In a world of this order, he must defend his position by employing the very methods which others have used to lead men's minds astray. If in a disordered world, it is easy to use logic and dialectic to lead men astray, the fact is that the same tools have the merit of providing correctives. If the state of the world were such that the vision of the master would be dominant, such methods would not be necessary. Confucius' followers held fatalism in cycles of order and disorder of human history. Mozi rejected Confucian fatalism as wrong worldview. However, according to Mencius, wrong views are not the original cause of disorder. They are the symptoms of a disorder. The source of disorder is the evil deeds of evil rulers. Quote, Tyrants arose one after another. They pulled down houses in order to make ponds, and the people had nowhere to rest. They turned fields into hunting parks, depriving the people of their livelihood. Heresies and violence arose. End quote. Intellectual confusion and violence were themselves symptoms and consequence. 
distorted ideas simply reinforce and confirm pre-existent moral distortions. If men are to be disentangled from their wrong ideas, they must be met with intellectual argument. Perverse propositions yin ci, must be corrected with true propositions. Manchus agrees with Mo Zi, but disagrees with Zhuang Zi that arguments can be won. Manchus structures the intellectual situation of his times like this, quote, The words of Yang Zhu and Mo Zi fill the world. Those who do not turn to Yang Zhu turn to Mo Zi, end quote. He claims that Moism undermines parental authority. Moists hold the faith in universal love. Everyone loves everyone else equally. There is no distinction of love among family members. Especially, the father and son are in equal position of loving each other. This would have consequence of undermining parental authority. Mencius maintains that Yang Zhu undermines the authority of rulers. Yang Zhu emphasizes self-love. One is not to, quote, sacrifice one hair of one's body, end quote, to serve society. This would bring an end to the relationship between the ruler and the ruled. According to Confucianism, the ruled are supposed to be loyal to the ruler, and the ruler is supposed to show his care to the ruled. So, Mo Zi undermines the foundation of the familial order, and Yang Zhu undermines the foundation of the political order. This is a terrible intellectual situation. In a society where the moral authority of both the family and the political order are undermined by false doctrines, the tendencies to immorality are unavoidable. Although Manchus structures the intellectual situation of, of his times in this way, his criticism is primarily focused on utilitarian basis of moist morality. As we have discussed, Moses' universal love serves the general interest of mankind, and it is this emphasis on interest that becomes a crucial point of attack for Manchus. In the dialogue with Song Xing, Song Xing was a uh, moist, Manchus seems to approve of Song Xing's aim of preventing a cruel war between the states of Chu and Qin. Manchus states, quote, your purpose is lofty indeed, end quote. He then vehemently objects to the arguments which Sun Xing proposes to use to persuade the kings of Chu and Qin to refrain from war. Sun Xing's argument goes like this. War would not be in their interest. The war would greatly impoverish and weaken their people. This would, in the end, weaken their states and diminish their own wealth and prestige. The idea is that when actions detrimental to the general interests of mankind are taken, the more particular interests are, in the end, bound to suffer. According to Manchus, so long as human attention is focused wholly on presumed utilitarian results, no matter how great the results are, people will tend to desire these outcomes for themselves here and now. Mo argues that 
the particular interests of individuals of particular groups will be best served when the general interest of the greatest number is served. But it is not true. In neuro, the pursuit of the general interest will constantly disintegrate it into the pursuit of particular interests. People will not believe that the satisfaction of their immediate concrete desires will be served by the satisfaction of the long-term general interest. This is vividly illustrated in Manchu's argument with King Hui of Liang. When King Hui first meets Manchus, he says, quote, You must surely have some way of serving the interest of my state, end quote. At this, Manchus immediately points to the disintegrative effects of focusing on the results, such as the state's security, wealth, and power. If it is legitimate for Hui to sacrifice the state to this goal, why should the great ministers not say, quote, how can I serve the interests of my family, end quote? And why should the Shi and ordinary people not say, quote, how can I serve my own interests? End quote. Utilitarian consideration starts from particular interests. It is not the other way around. The difference between Mozi and Manchus is this. To Mozi, Selfishness is the commitment to a regard for my own interest or the interests of my immediate group, while justice is the commitment to the common interest of mankind as a whole. To mention the dichotomy is between the commitment to interests, whatever interest, or to humanity and righteousness as motives of action. Moses' distinction between selfishness and justice does not seem to stand the reasoning. King Hui assumes that he should be able to rely on the loyalty of his ministers and soldiers, even though they themselves may reap no benefits from his wars. Why should they not instead be interested in their own welfare? Manchus' reply to Mozi seems to be like this. It is in the family that the individual learns to act in terms of virtues, motives, as ends in themselves, rather than as means to ulterior ends. It's only this capacity of mankind to act in terms of what is right, without regard for consequences, that makes good social possible. Good social consequence can be achieved only if we assume a human capacity for acting in terms of ren and righteousness as ends in themselves. It is only men wholly motivated by the right who can in any long run produce a good society. Manchus' central task is to prove in the face of a doubting world that the achievement of a good society depends wholly on the inherent moral intentionality of good men. This is, of course, Confucius' philosophy of Ren. As with Confucius, Manchus is faced with two questions. One, how humans become good men? Two, 
how good man's ethical quality can transform the society as a whole. Confucius' followers failed to address these two questions. They merely focus on the practice of rice and music as the only way of internalizing Ren. As a result, they commit themselves to futile formalism. They have little faith that inner disposition of man could influence the world of their time. The moist moral psychology approach does not help either. They posit a kind of state of nature. According to them, individual human organisms are conceived initially as self-regarding creatures. Men have to be taught the utilitarian necessity of universal love. There is no inner source of morality. In this intellectual situation, a question is more urgent than others. That is, where one is to seek the source of moral action. This is the question of human nature. Confucianists usually recognize a common conception of what the nature of the noble man is. But they cannot go deeper. They do not give an, an account of ontological source of morality. At Manchester's time, the question of human nature has already been discussed. Gao Zi believes that human nature is neither good nor bad. Others believe that there are those who are good by nature and those who are bad. Others believe that with the rise of King Wen and Wu, the people were given to goodness, while with the rise of King Yu and King Li, they were given to cruelty. Others believe that there are those who are good by nature and those who are bad." End quote. So, here we have the notion that moral categories are creation of society, and the view that moral propensities are results of hereditary endowments. In order to make clear these issues, we have to address the question of human nature. We will see how this is done in Manchester's philosophic anthropology.